mean, I just did a podcast on lab, the lab leak, lab, lab right? Leak. I was never skeptical of the lab leak hypothesis. Brett was very early on saying, this is, this is a lab leak, right? Um, at a point where my only position was, who cares if it's a lab leak, right? Like this, there's, the thing we have to get straight is, what do we do given the nature of this pandemic? But also we should say that you've actually stated that it is a possibility. Oh yeah. You just said it doesn't, doesn't it, quite it matter. Did, I mean, it, the time to figure that out, now I've actually, I have had my, my podcast guest on this topic changed my view of this because the, you know one of the guests, uh, Alina Chan, made the point that no, actually the the best time to figure out the origin of this is immediately, yeah. right? Because in the evidence you lose touch with the evidence, and I hadn't really been thinking about that. Like I didn't. I, if you come back after a year, um, you know there are certain facts you might not be able to get in hand. But I've always felt that it didn't matter for two reasons. W one is we had the genome of the virus and and we could design, we we're very quickly designed, immediately designing vaccines against that genome. And that's what we had to do. And then we had to figure out how to vaccinate and to, and to mitigate and to develop treatments and all of that. So the origin story didn't matter. Generically speaking, either or origin story was politically inflammatory and made the Chinese look bad, right? And the Chinese response to this looked bad, whatever the origin story, right? They're not yeah. cooperating. They're letting, they're, they're stopping their domestic flights, but letting their international flights uh, go. I mean, it's just, they were bad actors and they should be treated as such regardless of the origin, right? And, and you know, I, I would argue that the wet market origin is even more politically invidious than the lab leak origin. I mean- Why do you think? Because for lab leak, for, to my eye, the lab leak could happen to anyone, right? We're all running, all these advanced countries are running these dangerous labs. That's a practice that we should be worried about, you know, uh, in general. We know lab leaks are a problem. There have been multiple lab leaks of even worse things but that haven't gotten out of hand in this way, but, you know, w worse pathogens. Um, we're, we're wise to be worried about this. And on some level, it could happen to anyone right? The wet market makes them look like barbarians living in another century. Like, you got to clean up those wet markets. Like, what are, you, what are you doing putting a bat on top of a pangolin, on top of a duck? On top? It's like, get your shit together. So, like, if anything, the wet market makes them look worse, in my view. Now, I'm sure there's, uh, I'm sure that what they actually did to conceal a lab leak, if it was a lab leak, I mean, all of that's going to look odious. Um, Do you think we ever get to the bottom of that? I mean, one of the big negative, um, I would say, failures of Anthony Fauci and so on is to be transparent and clear and just a good communicator about gain and functional research, the dangers oh, yeah. of that, the success, like the you know why it's a useful way of research, but it's also dangerous, right? You know, just being transparent about that as opposed to just coming off really shady. Of course, the conspiracy theorists and the the politicians are not helping, but this just yeah. created a, a giant mess. Yeah, no, I would agree. That, so, so that exchange with Fauci and Rand Paul that went viral, yeah, I would agree that Fauci looked like he was taking refuge in kind of very lawyered language yeah. and not giving a straightforward account of what we do and why we do it and so yeah, I think it, it looked shady, it played shady, and it probably was shady. I mean, I don't, I don't know how personally entangled he is with any of this, but yeah, the, the gain of function research is something that I think we're wise to be worried about. And insofar as I judge myself adequate to have an opinion on this, I think it should be banned, right? Like I, I, I'm a pr probably, a podcast I'll do, you know, if, if you or somebody else doesn't do it in the meantime, um, you know, I, I would like a virologist on to defend it against a virologist who, who, who would uh, criticize it. Forget about just the gain of function research. I don't even understand virus hunting at this point. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know. I don't even know why you need to go into a cave to find this next vi virus that could be circulating among bats that may jump zoonotically to us 
why do that when we can make when we when we can sequence in a day and and make vaccines in a, in a weekend? I mean, like yeah. like what well, what kind of head start do you think you're getting? That's a surprising new thing. How quickly yeah. you can develop a vaccine? Exactly. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really interesting. But the shadiness around lab leak. I think the point I didn't make uh, about Brett's style of engaging this issue is people are using the fact that he was early on lab leak to suggest that he was right about ivermectin and about mRNA v- vaccines and all the rest. Like, no, that, that that's none of that connects. And it was possible to be falsely confident. Like, you shouldn't have been confident about lab. No one should have been confident about lab leak early, even if it turns out to be lab leak. Right. It was always plausible. It was never definite. It still isn't definite. Zoonotic is 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 also quite plausible. It, it, was, it certainly was super plausible then. Um, both are politically uh, uncomfortable. Uh, both were, both at the time were inflammatory to be banging on about when we were trying to secure some kind of cooperation from the Chinese. Right. So there's a time for these things, and 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 it's possible to be right by accident. Right, that's the th- that is, it, it mat- your, your reasoning, the style of reasoning matters wh- whether you're right or not. You know, it's like because your style of reasoning is dictating what you're going to do on the next topic. Sure, but th- this is a uh, this multivariate situation here. It's it's really difficult to know what's right on COVID given all the uncertainty, all the chaos, especially when you step outside the pure biology, virology of it, and you start getting to policy. Hmm. It's, yeah. it's really- Yeah, it's just trade-offs, yeah. Like transmissibility of the virus. Sure, vac- <laughs> just knowing if 65% of the population gets vaccinated, what effect would that have? Just even knowing those things, just modeling all those things. Um, Given all the other incentives, I mean Pfizer. But you, I don't had, know you, what had, to think. you had the CEO of Pfizer on your podcast. Did you leave that conversation feeling like this is a person who is consciously uh, reaping windfall profits on a dangerous uh, vaccine uh, and putting everyone at intolerable risk or do you think this person did you think this person was, was making a good faith attempt to save lives uh and had no no bad no no uh, taint of bad incentives or something between uh, the, the thing i sensed and i felt in part it was a failure on my part but i i sensed that i was talking to a politician mm. so it's not thinking of there was malevolence there or benevolence. There was a- um, He just had a job. He, he put on a suit and I was talking to a suit, not mm-hmm. a human being. Now he said that his son was a big fan of the podcast, which is why he wanted to do it. So right. I thought I would be talking to a human being. And I asked challenging questions, what I thought the internet thinks otherwise. Every single question in that interview was a challenging one. Mm-hmm but it wasn't grilling, which is what people seem to want to do with pharmaceutical companies. There's a deep distrust of pharmaceutical companies. But what was the alternative? I mean, I, I totally get right, that's, that windfall that's profits at a time of, of you know, a public health emergency yeah. looks bad. It's a bad, it is a bad look, right? Yeah. But yeah. What do, how do we reward and return capital to, to, to risk takers? Who are who will spend a billion dollars to design a new drug for a disease that may, maybe only harms a you know a single digit percentage of the population? It's like, well, what do we want to encourage, and wh- and who do we want to get rich? I mean, so like the person who cures cancer, do we want that person to get rich or not? We we want the we want the person who uh, gave us the iPhone to get rich, but we don't want the person who. Who cures cancer to get rich? I mean, what what are we I th- trying to do? I think it's do? a very gray area. So what we want is the person who declares that they have a cure for cancer to have authenticity and transparency. There's like, I think we're good now as a population smelling bullshit. And there is something about the the Pfizer CEO, for example, just CEOs of pharmaceutical companies mm-hmm. in general, just because they're so lawyered up, so much marketing yeah. PR people that they are. You just smell bullshit. You're not talking to real human. 
that it they just it just feels like none of it is transparent to us as a public. So like this whole uh, talking point that Pfizer is only interested in helping people just doesn't ring true, even though it very well could be true. It's the same thing with Bill Gates, hmm. who seems to be at scale helping a huge amount of people in the world. Yeah. And yet there's something about the way he delivers that message where people are like, this seems suspicious. What's happening underneath this? Right. There's certain kinds of communication styles that seem to uh, be more uh, serve as better catalysts for conspiracy theories. And I'm not sure what, what that is because I don't think there's an alternative for capitalism in delivering drugs that help people. But also at the same time, there seems to need to be more transparency. And plus like regulation that actually makes sense versus mm. it seems like uh, pharmaceutical companies are susceptible to corruption. Yeah, I, I, I worry <laughs> about all that. But I, I also do think that most of the people going into those fields and most of the people yes. going into government- yeah, they want to do are good. Doing it for good, and they're non-psychopaths trying to get good things done and try, trying to solve hard problems. And they, they're they not trying to get rich. I mean, many of the people are, it's like, they're, I mean, bad incentives are, are something, again, I've, I've, I've uttered that phrase 30 times uh, yeah. on this podcast, but it's it's just, Almost everywhere it explains normal people creating terrible harm, right? It's, it's not that there are that many bad people, you know. And uh, yes, it makes it makes the truly bad people that much more remarkable and, and worth paying attention to. But the bad incentives and, and the bad and the and the the uh, the power of bad ideas do do much more harm because I mean that's what that what that's what gets good people running in the wrong direction or or um doing things that are that are clearly creating unnecessary suffering 